You are listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. I'm Elena Paventa, Executive Communication Coach and TEDx Organizer. With each episode, I'll share with you communication tips and ideas from top business leaders to help you excel in your career. Hello, welcome to the next episode of Ideas and Leaders podcast. Today, my guest is Emmy Wang. She is the founder of Always on Purpose. She's an executive leadership coach, author, and facilitator. And today we're going to speak about achieving peace of mind and living with true intention. Hi, Emmy. It's great to have you on Ideas and Leaders. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for our conversation. This will be fun. So, Emmy. I know that you're working with with many leaders and uh, often we see this problem that we are achieving professional goals that we set and we're going higher and higher. We have more and more, but still we don't feel satisfied. We don't feel enough. Do you Mm. see this problem very often? All the time, all the time. I mean, you couldn't have said it better. I feel like what you're talking about right there is such a predominant theme in coaching for a lot of us leadership coaches. It's, gosh, I've achieved this. I, I got to get to the next thing. What's the next thing? You know, I, I'm not done. I'm not done. And and I'm all for ambition. I am all for that feeling of, of accomplishment and impact. But quite often, you know, masked by this theme of ambition really is this tremendous discontent that fuels a pervasive anxiety that a lot of high achieving individuals feel. And what we're talking about right now, this is such a predominant theme in coaching, like I said, and really what it all comes down to is, I think it has so much to do with how we're conditioned in our society. Because if you think about what happens and how we start as children and what's true is we kind of get fed this formula and the formula sounds like this, go to school and get good grades so that you can get into a good college, get into a good college so that you can get a good job, get a good job. So you can make lots of money, make lots of money so that you can then be happy. And so what happens is we place our trust in this kind of do what you're told and follow this, this formula find the majors and find the jobs that are going to be fruitful and, you know, and give you prosperous so that then you can be happy. And so really what we're kind of conditioned to do is to chase a strategy and put all of our eggs in this basket of, if I follow this strategy, right, then I'm going to, I'm going to live the good life, but we never stop and examine well, is this really what I want to be doing? And some folks do feel that early on. It's like, I really, really don't want to study law, mom. I really just, I really want to cook. And mom says, well, that's not going to get you anywhere. You, you know, you know, do, do a study something that's actually going to give you lots of money. And so early on, we're trained away from following our feeling and we start following a strategy. And so the problem here is that we are all trained to figure it out and not feel it out. And, you know, last I'll say about this is I think what's really, and, and this is so important and this whole thing about, oh, hey, feel it out. It's, this is not woo woo. This isn't some sort of <laughs> like, oh, feel it out. It's not like that. The reason this is so critically important is because everything you want, everything you think you want, it's actually not for the thing. So whether that's, I want a new house, I want a bigger house, I want a relationship, I want a family, I want, you don't want it for the thing. You want it because you think it's going to make you feel a certain way. So at the end of every desire is a desired feeling state, but we're not taught that. And so because we're not taught that, we stop at the thing. But we don't even check to see if it, it does this thing, is this thing that I'm, I'm, I'm actually wanting, this promotion, this, you know, this this thing that I've set my sights on, does that actually get me to the desired feeling state I want? Because we're not taught to really ensure congruency or at least even be aware of what we want, then we end up following the thing, getting the thing, and then feeling hollow. And so that it's exactly why we feel what you just kind of started here with. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that the, this problem is so, so important and it is everywhere right now because we can have more, we can be more, we have a lot of things that are accessible to us, right? <clears throat> and I can even relate to it myself because I had this uh, couple of years in my life when it was all about the achievement, you know? Mm -hmm. I would do run marathons and, and things like that. And then after some time, I would be, okay, so I achieved this, 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 and this. And I had, you know, a number of LinkedIn posts with, with, with my successes. And then, so what? So it, mm -hmm. it made me feel good for a moment. But then, again, we need to kind of come up with new goals or we need yeah. to change something. So what do you suggest to your clients do we yeah. have to set those big goals all the yeah. time or yeah. do we just change the strategy at some point oh uh, i well i think it's a little bit of both i love this question because you know what i advise folks to do and honestly the question i'm i'm gonna pro propose here can be such an eye-opener for folks but i'm gonna offer just a simple shift in the question oftentimes we ask what do i want to do what do I want to achieve? And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but what I want to bolster it with, or at least lead with is well, what do I want to feel? It's like, whoa, oh, I don't, well, yeah, it's a good question. What do I want to feel? And then I and really encourage folks to get granular. I mean, no doubt you, <laughs> no doubt the answer is going to be good. I want to feel good, but that's, I mean, that's, that can be helpful, but not super helpful. So instead you want to really get clear. Well, what does good mean to me? If I were to double click on that, what does that mean for me? Because I'll guarantee right now, Elena, my good is probably different than your good, right? So it might be, I want to feel spacious. I want to feel connected. I want to feel purposeful. I don't know. It's, it's going to be different, but we have to start with that question. What do I want to feel? And so now with that highlighted in, in our awareness, what happens is now your perception is going to shift just a little bit because now that that's illuminated, what you're going to perceive is going to be slightly different, or at least the things that are going to line up with, with that feeling state are going to be a bit more obvious. And so that's when you get the insight or at least start to get the inklings that, oh, my goals might need to shift a little bit because I'm all for setting goals. I think goals are incredible. But but my whole thing about this is only set goals as if it, if it feels good. Like if it feels uncomfortably exciting, if it feels good. If you're setting goals and it feels deflating, if it feels impossible, then you're working against yourself because again, everything you want is for a feeling. So don't do anything that's incongruent with the feeling you want. Right? So we set these goals or at least we I always call them signposts. Like we want to we want to throw out some signposts. Like okay, that that feels good. If I put that signpost out there because I want to feel that, if I, if, I, if I go for that, that actually feels really good. So you throw that signpost out, you go in that direction. Now, naturally, as you move in that direction, trying to realize whatever it is that you set at that signpost, like the, the landscape is going to change. What becomes, what you know, because as you go in that direction, what wasn't clear from where you're standing now starts to become clear. And you're like, oh, actually, the train's a little different, you know, from, from, two miles away, it was, I couldn't really tell that there were all these ditches and all this, all these obstacles. So, you know, maybe I'm going to move the signpost a little bit. And so we have to be fluid and flexible and recognizing that we throw these signposts out to give us, you know, a, a kind of a, a focal point to create momentum in a positive direction that feels good. And as we go in that direction, it's like recognizing, oh, actually, I can change this. I can move this according to the data that I'm getting. You know, and some some of us do that rather instinctively, but others, you know, a reason that people come to coaching is because they don't realize that they can because it seems like failure if they move away from their signposts. They're like, oh, wait, no, but I said I was going to do this. I'm going to do it at all costs. But then we do it at all costs and it's against, it completely defeats, you know, because it, it, it's completely opposite of, to the feeling that they want. So that's what I say about goals. And that's that's the question that we want to start asking is, what do you want to feel? What do you want to feel? Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I think that what you mentioned is so important that we need to be flexible. So we don't need to be, you know, 100% uh, be wanting one thing and, and not changing it because uh, it, it changes all the time. And especially now, I think that the last couple of years we're living in, in such an uncertainty, everything is changing. You know, the the 
pandemic situation, political situation, every day is bringing us something new. And I think that uh, many people, they, they are they become more and more frustrated that, okay, I want to achieve something, but I can't because of different reasons. Uh, so do you, do you feel that uh, it is changing a little bit in the last couple of years? And how, how, how do you see this problem? You know, it's a, this is a big conversation. And I would say, you know, where I narrow in, in everything that you've just shared is the state of frustration that we feel with the conditions around us. And that can be debilitating. And in my, my work and in the work that I offer to others, my philosophy, I feel like states like frustration and disappointment, anxiety, all of that stuff works against us. And believe it or not, it's manufactured. We, we do that to ourselves and it just gets in the way of clarity. It gets in the way of, of forward momentum, it gets in the way of our joy. And so, you know, if uh, there's only so much we can do to change the world around us. And if we want to thrive, we have to learn the skill of being able to thrive, irregardless of the conditions. We have to learn to thrive unconditionally. We have to learn to become resilient to all the stuff around us. Now, am I saying, hey, just learn to be okay with what is and just become <laughs> totally tolerant to crap and resigned to the fact that you can't change the world. No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that if, if we really want to thrive, we have to look at our relationship to what is, because if we are going to, if we're, if we're in a habit of constantly pushing against what is because we're judging it because we don't want it because we think it should be a different way because you know, it wasn't what we planned for. And so now we're all upset about that because that wasn't the plan, right? That's just us jamming up our own bandwidth because that's resistance that we are sustaining that's keeping us from clarity about how to work with what is, how to be innovative, how to create new sites or new focal points that would actually bring us joy. So it's, yeah, the world's changing. There's a lot. There's There's stuff we can do to affect change in our own lives, but there's I mean, let's be real. We There's only so much we can do and we all know that. And so the opportunity is truly to learn how to be resistantless to many of the things around us so that we can be really proactive. So, uh, Amy, what do you think we can do to feel less uncertain and, and to be more flexible in, in all of those situations that life is bringing us? Yeah. So this ends up being a big conversation in a lot of the work I do, because it really all, again, stems back to this idea of feeling and the feeling I narrow in on when it comes to frust or sorry, it's uncertainty. It's really that feeling of frustration, anxiety, because that's what comes up when we feel like we're out of control. We can't control what's going on around us. And it's exactly that state of frustration, disappointment, anxiety that completely and totally gets in our way of creating a life that we love. And, you know, the default for most of us is to want to blame the world outside and say, these conditions out there that I was not expecting, that I was not planning, that in fact, I don't want, these are the reasons that I'm frustrated. These are the reasons that I'm upset. These are the reasons that I can't do what I want to do in the world. And I say, well, you know, the conditions around us are going to be the conditions that they are. Each of us we do have an ability to change and influence the world around us to a degree, but there's a lot of stuff that, you know, that is, is just as it is. And so what's happening is that we're pushing against what is that just eats up our resources. And so if we, if we truly want to thrive, we have to realize that thriving is not thriving by moving the pieces around of the world, by affecting and controlling the, the, the stuff around me. We truly thrive when we can learn to thrive unconditionally. Well, what does that mean? It means to thrive regardless of the conditions. So it's recognizing that the world is going to be as it is, that things are going to happen. And yeah, I've got agency to change certain things. But there's going to be a lot of stuff I can't personally affect right here in this right now moment. And so my the opportunity is I have to learn to be resistantless to what is so that I actually have the resources to create. 
And by no means am I saying I've got to learn to be resistant less so that I can be tolerant of crap or because I'm just resigned. No, it's not that. It's I want to learn to be with, okay with what is so that I've got all the resources to think innovatively, to to be creative about how to work with what is. And in fact, when you drop resistance to this stuff around us, right? So let's say, you know, there's conditions, the, the pandemic, we hate it. What else? Oh, oh, it's so annoying. We When we judge it, when we push against it, that causes us to be negative. So when we let go of the resistance to what is, just let it be what it is without judgment, we actually float up the emotional scale and we're, we're in, a, we're in, a, we're in a, a better feeling state and we've got resources to do something about it. So that's, it. again, it's a really big conversation that I talk a lot about. Well, I, I talk a fair amount in, in my new book, Living on Purpose, but yeah. it's it's really a, a big topic around just what <laughs> or what do we have to do in order to truly thrive? Yeah, yeah. I know. I wanted, uh, by the way, to ask you about your book, Living on Purpose. So I know yeah. that uh, earlier this year, uh, in in May, the book was released and it became an Amazon bestseller. So congratulations on oh, this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm very interested about this because uh, your book shows readers how to feel more connected to people around them, how to be more satisfied with their lives. So uh, can you give us a couple of tips from this book? Yeah. So how how can we be more satisfied apart from what we already discussed? Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to spoil it. So I'll, I'll, I'll frame it this way. This So this book, it's it's titled Living on Purpose. And the subtitle is Five Deliberate Choices to Realize Fulfillment and Joy. And you know, this book came to be because I've been coaching for over 10 years now. And I've had truly thousands of conversations with the most incredible and most diverse and amazing individuals from all walks of life, truly all walks of life. And in in all of the work that I have done and the research that I do, it was around 2015, I started to recognize, you know, there are some really very clear themes that seem to be somewhat universal among my entire spectrum of clients, in the ways in which we get in our own way, the ways in which we hold ourselves back. And so it was around 2015 that I was like, you know, there's, there's a, there, there's a, there's a way out of this for sure. And so I started, you know, offering this roadmap to folks that I was working with, you know, and, and the five choices, these five deliberate choices, they're really perceptual shifts. They're practices that we could take to really get out of our own way, to drop self-imposed limitation, to break free from a lot of the fear that we hold. We don't even know that we're holding and really begin to live a life that we absolutely love, claim the life that we are born to live. And so in this book, um, I kind of, I spell it out so that, you know, anyone can go on this journey and free themselves and claim the life they were born to live. They don't have to work with me in order to, to achieve that. And so that, in 2015, I was I was really clear. I'm like, okay, I know what this book needs to be, but it wasn't until 2019 that I really felt like it was time to write it because I knew from 2015 to 2019, I'm like, you know, there's still a lot of research I got to I, I want to do. There's still a lot of conversations I want to have and case studies and and so it was around 2019. I'm like, okay, now is now is the time. It's it's time to get this book out there. And so here we are. <laughs> Great, great. So I'm sure that our listeners are very interested. I will uh, make sure that the link to your book is under our podcast. Yeah. But also let's uh, maybe give uh, our listeners some sneak peeks. So if you were to give a couple of recommendations, so how can how can I begin to live on purpose right now? What can I do? What can I change? Mm. So we have to start with, there's, oh gosh, there's so many things to say about that. So I'll take it down to its lowest common denominator. And, and again, this is what my book focuses heavily on is the superpower that we all have, which is choice. We all get to choose everything really, truly about our experience. And, and a lot of us think that our freedom is going to be come from making the right choices at the level of action, meaning, okay, if I choose to eat this 
salad instead of this hamburger, that's probably a good choice. And that helps my health. Yeah, absolutely. If I choose to go to bed early and make sure that I get eight hours of sleep instead of be irresponsible and get four hours of sleep every night, that's probably a better choice. All of those choices, incredibly important. But what I, but, but what I focus on is while we want to be making good choices at the level of action, really what we want to harness is choice at the level of perception. How is it that I'm choosing to perceive the stuff around me? And how is it that I'm choosing to interpret the stuff around me? And so these, so that's, that's where we want to start thinking about, okay, if I want to be on purpose, then I need to harness choice because that's what it means to be in the driver's seat. Because when I say let's be on purpose, it's not so much how do I identify my purpose as a noun? It's really more an adverb. How do I be on purpose? in my life? How do I know that I am the one that's creating and in the driver's seat? And I am, I'm, I'm the one in charge here. And that has to do with how we harness choice at the level of perception. And I'll just, and here's a sneak peek. One of the, one of the most powerful choices we can, we can make is at the level of perception is something that we were talking about here. And so one of the choices is how do you choose to feel it out and not figure it out? Because when you understand what we were talking about here at the start, everything we want is for a feeling. And instead, if you were to choose to navigate by feeling it out, not figuring it out, right, which might sound a little like, exciting. It's like, oh, I don't know. How would I do that? Well, the so the, the we, we, you know, I totally spell it out. How, what does it actually mean to feel it out? And how is it the shortest path of least resistance to the most abundance. And so that's something that you can start thinking about. Like, wow, okay, if I really wanted to be on purpose in my life, yeah, it would be about feeling it out, not figuring it out because I'm gonna go for the feeling, not the thing that I think is gonna get me that feeling. So just opening up that idea and inviting yourself to feel it out, not figure it out. It's amazing how things start to shift. Great, thank you for, for giving us this tool. Uh, I recommend our listeners to try and ask yourself those questions. I, I will, I definitely will after this recording this episode. So thank you so much. So we need to focus on our feelings. We need to, to focus on our purpose and to, to be in this driver's seat. Mm, I think that at certain point when we do this, we can have um, the lack of confidence or imposter syndrome that can uh, that everyone has and I'm working with leaders you're also working with leaders and and uh, we know that uh, different people have this lack of confidence and this imposter syndrome at different levels right even if uh, a person is super confident, then at certain point he says, okay, so maybe I can't do this. Maybe something is standing on the way. So do you think that there is a way to kind of overcome those, uh, those moments and how can we do this? Yeah, absolutely. Again, this is also a very big, amazing, rich conversation. Imposter syndrome is so prevalent and really what's going on here is it has everything to do with the relationship we have with ourselves. Meaning, you know, all of us regard ourselves in, in certain ways and all of us are going to have beliefs about who we are. And, and I am, I am really quite certain that due to the way in which we develop as humans, starting at a pretty young age, we will take on false limiting beliefs such as, oh, I'm not good enough, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not cool, or I don't belong, or I'm unlovable, or fill in the blank. All of us take on these, and I say false, because all of us take on these beliefs to make sense of the pain we feel from perceived rejection in our young years. Because the bigger the bigger piece of the story here is that the neuroscience of rejection, rejection is like day, death to the brain, you know, and we're not talking about that. I wish we were as humans. So we just, it's it, all of us feel it and all of us are doing everything we can to navigate away from it. But in order to make sense of that, we will, we will establish these false limiting beliefs to make sense of the experiences we have in our younger years. Now, 
Is it only limited to our younger years? No, it can happen at any point in our life, but starts in our young years. And as a result of our life experiences, we will take on false limiting beliefs. Now, those false limiting beliefs are are ways in which we identify and they are there and they're not always conscious, but they are there. And the the short the short version of, of all of this is that imposter syndrome is purely the effect of a false belief being live in a moment due to the context in which someone is existing in, right? So if you're in a meeting and you're with folks that, you know, are of a stature that is, that is maybe perceived as higher than you or more celebrated or more credible, or, you know, anytime that we might be in an environment that feels um, risky, socially risky, then that very well is going to activate that sense of, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And it's exactly that live belief that fuels imposter syndrome because that is imposter syndrome. And so the question is, how do we get away from that? Well, that is also a very, very big conversation. It's entirely possible. And it takes understanding one, the neuroscience of rejection, recognize all of us are doing whatever we can to avoid it. Two, becoming very clear but what are those false beliefs that I've that I've taken on in order to make sense of my reality? And three, how do I choose otherwise? Because if imposter syndrome is live, it's simply because we are unconsciously, not consciously, unconsciously choosing to believe that we are not enough in that moment. And so what's the mechanism? What, what do we need to do in order to not choose that falsehood, but to choose truth? And so it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty clear process that I absolutely spell out in it's, it's mainly in part two and part three of of living on purpose and it's and it's such an amazing journey and I'll tell you I'll tell you Elena it's to shift into a way of being that is not of lack it's one of the easiest things you'll ever do however it can be one of the hardest things we ever do because we're so used to living from this belief right and so yeah, so Emmy, what would you uh, recommend our listeners after all of those tips uh, and tricks that you covered? Thank you so much for those. So to sum up, what what are your main recommendations for our listeners to, to live on purpose and to live with the intention? Yeah, well, the first question that is really great to ask is, how on purpose do I actually feel in my own life? And just waking up to this idea that we're very likely on autopilot is can be an eye-opener in and of itself that's going to catalyze some insights. So just making an assessment, like how on purpose do I actually feel in my own life? And then see what that sparks. The second question is to ask, okay, well, if I intend to be on purpose, then now I want to know how do I want to feel? in my life. And then if you start really getting clear in a granular way, I want to feel significant. I want to feel loved. I want to feel love. I want to feel connection. You decide. Then once that becomes clear, take stock of what's going on in your life. What are you up to? Is it a direct line to those feelings or is it a roundabout way that actually works is working against you? And then just being honest with yourself, like, is this really what I want? And so that right there is a huge question. And then if we want to, to take life by the horns, the relationship we have with ourselves is fundamental. It forms the lens through which we look through that gives rise to everything we perceive. So if we really, really, really want to be in the driver's seat, we want to thrive. We want to be on purpose. We want to start asking ourselves, well, what's this relationship I have with myself? And so if you want to identify if any live false limiting beliefs are there, live or dormant, or just any that are there, then you want to ask yourself the question, what am I most afraid other people would either find out or decide about me? And you want to answer that from your survival brain, not your logical brain. The logical brain will tell you that you have no answer there. But if you really listen to your fear-based brain and let the fear come up and be like, oh gosh, I'd really hate for them to think that I'm an imposter or that I'm not good enough. Or, then the truth is whatever you answer with, is really just a sign that that's what you believe about yourself. And so, and, and why do we do this? We do this because you want to get clear. What is going on? 
what is it that you're doing in your own world, in your own perception that's that's creating the reality that you live? And so those are some pretty fundamental basic steps we can take that's going to carve a new path forward. Great. Thank you so much for those questions. Very important, very important and meaningful questions. So dear listeners, write down those questions, answer them. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that it will bring more clarity. And of course, uh, you can uh, contact Emmy, you can follow her. So Emmy, how can our listeners reach out to you on social yeah. media? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely check out my website, which is always on purpose.com. And you can reach out you can reach out there. There's a lot, there's ways to stay connected via my website through my text community resources that I have available. I'm also on LinkedIn at Amy Elisa Wong, and you can just do a search on always on purpose or Amy Wong, always on purpose. I'm right there. I'm, I'm big on LinkedIn. And also, you know, definitely check out the book living on purpose, five deliberate choices to realize fulfillment and joy. And if you want, and I did the audio book. So if you're the type of person that likes to listen more than read, definitely get the audio book. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, I'm sure that our listeners like listening as they're listening to this podcast right now. So yeah, audio book is, a, is always a great idea. So thank you so yeah. much, Emmy. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for all of the wisdom that you shared. And of course, I'm inviting our listeners to, to read your book to get more details. Thank you, Emmy. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. Did you enjoy this episode? Let me know that you listened by tagging me in your LinkedIn profile and using a hashtag Ideas and Leaders. See you in the next episode.